Good morning, Lo. And Kuzungpo uh, to all the participants. Honorable Tsopun, uh, members of parliament, a uh, lot of my friends, common faces that I see here. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this important conference. So I'll be talking about clientelism and accountability in goodness politics, and I'll be really rushing because I have uh, more number of slides. If you have any questions, uh, please keep it for the floor. Long. And uh, before I start, thank you, Okinga, for being our moderator. Uh, so in this presentation, I'll be mainly talking about, uh, you know, uh, clientelism in business politics. I'll explain what that is. Now, the whole idea behind this presentation is to build a discourse. I'm not an expert uh, on clientelism. I'm a journalist by profession, but I think all of us have the right to talk about issues. That's what the sense of democracy is. The, you know, the, the opportunity to contribute to the national discourse land, I hope we'll be able to achieve uh, through my presentation some sort of discourse on the idea of clientelism. Also, I'll be touching on political leadership and the idea of moral accountability for failed or poor quality public projects, which leads to leakage in public resources. And then what do we do to discourage clientelism in politics? So the bottom line is, as we have always said, should we not cultivate honesty, moral accountability, grace, you know, ideals of integrity, dignity, grace in our politics? These are the things we aspire to, but at the end of the day, uh, how far are we from getting there? This is my take a point, the Galefo Hospital that fell sick recently. It is a major public infrastructure that was funded by the government of India at the cost of 835 million, inaugurated last year, July 2018. But media reports right after inauguration, even within seven, eight months, media reports of how the quality was compromised have been, uh, you know, a flood in, in, the, in, the, in the media, the reports. And uh, so the people of Galefu have said that the, one of the reasons they feel is the construction was rushed in order to be inaugurated by the incumbent government. Now, what does this mean? Uh, this was in uh, July 31, 2018, the inauguration. And then... This was in uh, recently, uh, July 15, one year, and you have the ceilings falling apart. Uh, very interesting from Quinzel, you know, safety of the people inside the Guelph Hospital. I've been there, by the way, and it's a very scary, humongous building that doesn't really inspire confidence and safety and security when you're inside it. So where is the accountability? Who do you fix accountability on? Is it the contractor or the contractor's engineer, supervising engineers, project manager, tender committee, health officials, auditors? Who do we fix accountability on? Or is it on the moral responsibility, you know, on the political leadership, the former prime minister, health minister, the minister of MOWHS? Because this money, 835 million, was Indian people's taxpayers' money, and they're going to ask for accountability to the Putinist government very soon. You people are not seem to be using our money seriously. And uh, how do you respond? So these are the issues uh, I think democracy also raises. A city called White Elephant, all of us know about the education city. It started in 2012 during deputy government time. Huge uh, idea of 1,000 acres, you know, a lot of things happened. Uh, education Act, the city act was passed by parliament. Some work happened. You know, there was an account, city account in BNB, but the project was shut in 2014 when the new government came into power, took office, and when the National Land Commission said that the acquisition of land in Wong Sisina was illegal. And recently, MOW just said, it's closed. But then, whose resources did we waste? Did the resource belong to a political party? Did it belong to uh, some individuals? Or was it resources of the people of Bhutan? That is where the idea of accountability should, should come in. That's where we should transcend politics and political divides, political boundaries, when you question about public resources, because those belong to the state, not to a political party, or to individuals. Now, who accounts again? The board, DHO officials, again, the political leadership, prime minister, the education minister at the time. These are questions I'm asking. And, uh, you know, look at other projects like PHPA1, Domestic Airport, Samrang Megaform, Samrang Water Treatment Plant. These are ailing. These projects are just prolonging 
taking in a lot of resources. So we will ever, will we ever see anyone being taken to task? To, to, uh, will we ever see anyone explaining why the slow progress on this, uh, you know, wasteful uh, projects? Now that's where the idea of political clientelism comes. For a country like Bhutan, that is research trapped all the time. The kind of politics that we see today, promoted by political parties, is, uh, is, is, is quite interesting because informally I call it shopping list politics, but what formally they call it clientelism, which means, is, you know, the political parties or leaders giving goods, material goods in return for electoral support. And this happens in the absence of uh, ideological affinities that parties, you know, uh, uh, do not stand on, where personal contacts and our networks are more important. And uh, it's, you know, the Philip Kafer, the economist with the World Bank, has said that clientelism, clientelism is more pervasive in countries where ideological distinctions between parties are imperceptible. Problem here, because all the manifestos are the same. All of us, all the three political parties promise the same things. Voters are lost. So what do you do? You give to the uh, political party you feel you're closest to, maybe because your cousin is participating or your uncle is participating, right? So what is political cl clientelism? So imaginary party, you have a party one that goes to community and says, see, I'll give you smartphones to all the households who vote for me. Another party goes and says, I'll give you Jesse calls to all the rural households if you vote for me. So, you know, the voters are uh, basically torn between two, uh, you know, handouts. Okay, look. By the way, PHP, uh, just imaginary party that I, it's, it's a power hungry party. Like APHP is another power hungry party. You know. This bargain leads to establishment of patronage. Like you have a patron and you have a client. <coughs> uh, so the clientelist parties, they rely on brokers, intermediaries, spies, campaign workers to monitor and, you know, uh, voters and the inclinations, okay? Look at the, another example. PDP will increase CDG to 5 million from 2 million. Introduce public transport in all girls. Is that necessary? PDP will ensure every girl has a fuel depot. Are those necessary? You know? So we're looking at public resources because this is strictly tied to what we have in our treasury. Then DNT's vehicle quota, 15 lakhs. This is very interesting you know, for those who have completed 10 years. And then those who have completed 20 years, it increases. You know, 30 to 40 years, it, it just goes. So this is what I call reckless vote buying strategies. PDP's pledge, the current two million a year, if it is increased you know, to five million a year, that means you are giving 10 million a year current, you're giving 50, uh, uh, 50 million a year to a Georg, which means 205 Georgs, 2.5 billion. Do you have the capacity? Add to this, the capital allocation to LG has increased 50% with 12 fiber plan. Do we have the capacity in the local governments to handle this kind of money? There, you know, are we looking at chaotic execution law? There is there ability to monitor and evaluate and audit public works in the LGs, the local governments? These are the questions that we are looking at. Similar <coughs> DNTs, you know, if you, if you look at, uh, you know, the increase in vehicle quota, it leads to, you know, I'm giving a hypothetical sense, a lot of expenditure. What would we achieve by giving vehicle quota to, you know, corporate employees and civil servants? You're just pleasing them, isn't it? To be very, you know, honestly, you're just pleasing your vote base. And how does it contribute to Bhutan's growth? It doesn't. It would not contribute to the country's growth. However, clientelism is not new. You know, materially oriented political strategies, even the US, they have the idea of pork uh, barrel politics, okay, where huge promises are made on infrastructure that are totally useless, do not contribute to the public growth, you know, the, the, the growth of the country. In India, a lot of money continues to change hand. And even in Bhutan, I think we've heard of, uh, you know, money doing rounds during political campaigns, right? Clientelism in Bhutan, the patron, you know, the diadetic alliance is involving two people, uh, unequal status, power resources. So you have a dasho who goes to the uh, villages, and then you have the misering yamchung at the end of the different spectrum, that unequal relationship. So the dasho is there, and the misering yamchung is expecting a lot, you know, from him, and says, Lass, I'll give you my both mo darudra chingese, no? And then the, but the beauty later I'll come is that, you know, that the commitment is very poor in this relationship, like clientelism, because you can manage. When you go to the ballot box, I might have promised my vote to PDP, but I can tell, you know, I can go and vote for DPD or DNT or BKP, you know? That's the beauty of the, uh, the, the ballot box. Like. So basically, it's a win-win bargain. It seems like win-win bargain, but it damages democracy, okay? So the patronage is the use of distribution, state resources, and known meritocratic basis for political gains. 
I think all of us have seen this. So who pays for boleros, helicopters, free Wi-Fi, farm roads, and domestic airports? It's your money and my money, now. That is with the National Treasury. This is public resource belongs to the people of Bhutan, right? And uh, we, are, we are just being given back our own money in the forms of boleros and in the forms of free Wi-Fi and whatever, you know? So politics basically leads to this kind of, and then it's an easy option, by the way. When a political party doesn't have an ideology, a policy-based, a programmatic-based uh, you know, stand, then it's very easy to go to a shopping list and say, look, this is, this is, this is what I'm going to deliver if you support me, right? So uh, a DPT is instantly remembered for domestic airports, PDP for helicopters and bolleros. We do not remember of any, do you remember any policy credentials on these parties? Not really, right? Very vague to think of what policies this, did this past two governments, you know, made. But then you can remember a lot of, you know, things they delivered. So that is clientelism law. It has, like I said, lack of mutual, you know, trust. Uh, with uh, with permission from my moderator, can I take additional few minutes? Now? Because I don't want to leave halfway through. <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> Uh, so clientelism involves, you know, reciproc and uh, voluntarism, but it also exploitation and domination uh, of the poor people who don't understand, do not understand how politics works, right? For them, if you go to the rural areas of Bhutan, politics <laughs> means by the time, you know, the elections arrive, a lot of people are just, you know, warmed up, you know, they feel good because, Darwin, you know, a lot of seras are coming. No, that's the thing. So the client will full of opportunities and defections at the same time. So it leads to a volatile electorate, fragile, you know, constituencies and problem of commitments, right? So we were not building a core constituent based on ideas and policies. So consequences of clientelism is that, you know, parties, they, they are less effective in legis legislature because a lot of time they spend looking for resources. Our own MPs looking for resources to fulfill their, you know, their, their commitment, right? They rush public works to showcase achievements because you have promised you have to better show it in five years. This often compromises the quality of public work. And then also, uh, you know, high corruption has been noticed in clientelist models now. Uh, diversion of resources to fulfill promises. Clientelism also linked to poverty and inequality. And, uh, you know, it undermines democracy. So a lot of MPs, I'm sure, would have told you, you know, that people think that job of an MP is to, you know, is to recharge their phones, arrange hospital you know, appointments, get their children enrolled in schools. I've had my MP friends telling me this, you know, oh, MP girl, like, you know, no, so they are coming from the city, please come and pick us up at the, you know, the bus stand. So, but then you're deflecting them from the real core work law. Consequences of it slows economic development, impairs democracy, and uh, allows dictators to hold into power. That's what, according to Susan Stocks, another uh, scholar on clientelism. It also undermines the capacity of the bureaucracy law because the uh, government in power has already promised so many things. It often comes in confrontation with the uh, bureaucracy that otherwise gives a good check and balance to the elected government. And the more party specific clients, the more divided supporters will be, right? So then what can be done? So I'm saying transition from clientelist to pro programmatic policy issue-based politics. I think this is what we should all aspire to. A, a good political party should aspire to. So that people are able to think themselves as citizens who receive public services for the taxes they are paying to the state rather than who are receiving freebies and special uh, favors for having to, you know, bargained their votes. And uh, policies must drive electoral outcomes not, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the shopping list. State must impose significant barriers to patronage, including strategic vote buying, okay? We have to demand moral responsibility, by the way, from our elected leaders. Right now, we, because we feel a compassionate society, we just let things be, it doesn't matter, Kimi Shada say, you know, but I think that is going to damage us, damage our democracy. We cannot afford. If somebody, a political leadership requires to be fixed, even taken to the court, we have to demand that. As, a, as awakened uh, electorate, as awakened citizens. Transparency in public spending processes, data on public pro procurement from planning to delivery of services. And also, we should have public or other, other authorities outside the system to be allowed to question government spending. Some global practices I'll quickly run through is the public finance monitoring systems that uh, have been instituted in certain democracies. We could do something similar so that the government, elected government is held accountable through stringent you know, uh, financial scrutiny. 
Public finance monitoring portal developed by the UN system in Serbia is a good example where people keep track of the public spending. And then public expenditure tracking system, that's PETS, another very good uh, you know, methodology for tracking public expenditure so that you know, it, you, you're able to take uh, care and look at uh, the process of the flawless and, and make sure that the budget do not get diverted to things that are not you know, meant. Social audits. Participative process, you know, through committee members monitor the implementation. Very important now, social idea of social audit because of the empowerment of LGs in terms of spending 50% uh, of the allocated five-year budget. And uh, CSOs could play a big role here, community-based monitoring and evaluation, evaluation systems. Participatory budgeting is another very important. So where the citizens come together, decision-making, allocating, and monitoring of uh, public spending is a big thing. Uh, it, it, you know, the studies have shown that uh, uh, participatory budgeting leads to significant shifts in government spending toward priorities, directly benefit the poor and the communities. Uh, strengthening local governments, I think in our case, it makes a special case now because 50%, like I said, and by the way, they are political in nature, which means they can set right priorities. They can set very apolitical, neutral priorities, which are not based on uh, you know, the party manifestos or party interest. So the voter question, we have already got basic good services, how do we add value? That's what voters should be asking. See, we have already got, the government, the state has already given us, you know, five-way plans deliver goods and services, but what would a political party add value to our quality of our lives? That's the question that our people should be asking. Uh, so recently, NC questioned the LG capacity in the, you know, the, during the recent uh, parliament session. General Secretariat, this is what I've always said, should own the five-year plans, and it should be general secretary that should be taking the five-year plans to the Georg for public consultations and not an elected uh, leader. Totally wrong, though. When an elected prime minister goes around uh, taking the document and giving wrong perception to the people that this is done by me, my government, that's wrong. We should have GNHC taking the uh, ownership of five-year plans so that you ensure neutrality, you ensure, uh, you know, the uh, apolitical interest in it, law. And by the way, it also falls in the end of the five year, you know. Strengthen the role of the media again here. How do we strengthen the media's role in public finance reporting? Uh, media should report those suspicions to the public. You know, spark debates. For example, Gallifo Hospital, wonderful work done by Quinsel, you know, and other media, you know, for raising this issue. Border education should continue to be, you know, the, you know, must see better links between policy promises and implementation so that people are likely to sacrifice the short-term gains for long-term, you know, uh, preferred policy outcomes. Uh, this is where a good, I think, democracy should eventually head, says Janila. And uh, thank you so much, Trish Delela, for listening to me.